Hello and welcome to Hyper Production with me, Rory. In this episode, we're going to be taking an in-depth first look at Ableton Live 9. Now, I know that Ableton Live 10 is dawning upon us, but I just want to touch over some of the more basic features and functionality settings within the application, so stay tuned. <laughs> Okay, so here we are in Ableton Live 9 in all its glory. Now, you're probably watching this and they've already got Ableton Live 10 out at the moment, which they've just recently released. But uh, most of you, or at least some of you, will be on Ableton Live 9 like I've got in front of me here. So I'll just explain about what you're first going to do. You're going to go up to Live, Preferences, and then we're just going to make sure that all the various different things involved with Ableton are matching up. And I'll explain it a little bit about what various options within this preference menu mean. So you've got the look and the feel. So language, obviously you're going to want English unless you're from another country, which you probably won't be understanding <laughs> this uh, this tutorial, which is fine. Don't show warnings. So if you've got any sort of failed plugins that keep coming up and warning you about it, you can just reset that so it doesn't necessarily warn you again. Follow behavior. So that's basically how it's going to run through various tracks with the play header. Hide labels. So basically any labels that you've got on there just simply hides them. Permanent scrub areas. So that's just scrubbing through audio so you can sort of scrub through it and hear it. Zoom display. Now this is probably going to be more beneficial for me right now because I'm on a 4K display. So then I can just simply click on that little triangle and drag my mouse up or down. And then it will follow suit and essentially change the resolution with that. Now, the one thing about that, if you zoom in too much or zoom in too far out, then the smoothness of the play header and the way things work does get slightly jerky. So it's probably best to keep it on 100%. But what I'm going to do is actually just zoom it in slightly because my monitor is quite big. Then you've got tracking clip colors. So auto assign track colors. That's basically if you do any takes, it will just automatically assign a nice noticeable color so that you can actually see what you've just recorded. Default track color. So Instead of it auto doing it, it does. It, you, you pick one that it normally does. Click color, random. So essentially, it's the same as auto assign. So on colors on the skin, you can have its default, or you can sort of change various ones. The disco is quite a popular one from what I've seen amongst my peers. And then you've also got some other ones there as well. I'm just going to keep it for default because that's the one that you guys are probably going to be looking at when you first open the bit software. Brightness, so you can again just click on that, drag it up and down so you can turn the brightness up or down. So that comes in quite handy if you're doing late night sessions and you don't want your eyes to be caning the next day. Colour intensity, so you can bleed it up like that or you can pull it down a little bit. So this is actually quite unique because you're obviously going to be staring at these screens for quite a long time or for quite a number of hours at a time within a session. So to get it looking right so it's easier on your eyes and you're not getting really fatigued that way, then this is definitely a cool handy way to try and help you with that. Then plug-in windows, multiple plug-in windows, you want that on unless you just want one plug-in to show at a time. So we'll go over that in a minute. But basically if you've got like a, a synth or something open up on a MIDI channel and you want two of them, so say like you copy and paste another MIDI channel and you want that exact same synth on there with the same settings and you could open up both the plugin user interfaces side by side and then you can just sort of copy and paste settings over or the easier way to do that if you don't want to have multiple plugin windows is then just save it as a preset auto hide plugin windows got that off auto open plugin custom editor so that's basically your plugin features at the bottom of the window which will be opening up at the bottom here as I say we'll go into that when we actually dive in Audio, so driver type, if you're on a Mac, it's going to be Core Audio. If you're on a Windows PC, it's probably going to be ASIO, I think. I've been running a Mac for the last sort of 10, 15 years, so I'm a little bit unfamiliar, I'm afraid, with uh, PC setups. Audio input device, we have a Scarlett 89 20. Yours will just basically come up with a name with whatever you're using. So if it's M Audio, it'd be M Audio something, or maybe Tractor or something like that, Native Instruments. So just click on the one that you're using. I highly recommend just keeping the input device the same as the output device, because typically that's going to be what you're plugging mics and things in. To as well. So channel configuration, you would normally do that within the audio interfaces built in software or it should come with something. So I know Focusrite comes with the control center. So then you can control the inputs and outputs via that. It just makes your life a lot easier when you're coming into the DAW. Otherwise, you're going to have two different configurations coming from the DAW and then into the main sort of program that's running it from your actual computer. Input output sample rate. Now you probably just want to leave this at 44.1 kilohertz. That's kind of the standard. You can go up to 48 
8000, but typically that is your standard there. Default SR and pitch conversion, high quality. So when you're stretching and warping audio, so if you're like making it longer or making it shorter, it will then sort of take a little longer to process, but then it will keep the quality of that audio to a high standard. Buffer size, 512 samples should be more than fine. If you're getting a lot of pops and crackles from when you're playing back your audio, then increase that slightly, but then you will get more latency. So if you're recording an instrument, you want to go lower samples because the latency will be less. But then if you're getting lots of pops and crackles when you're playing back the audio, just increase the buffer size and then hopefully that should go away. But do mess around with that and have a play with it and find whatever suits you. But 512 to, I believe, 256 are normally the two best ones we start with and most computers nowadays can actually handle that. Driver error compensation. So that's basically if you are if you have a latency that's a bit too much or you want to sort of delay something a bit, then you can obviously do that. But typically you won't need to touch that necessarily. And then we've got a test tone. So that's basically just making sure everything's in tune and you've got it at uh, 440 hertz which is kind of like the industry standard tuning and there's an interesting bit of history about that but i won't be going into it right this moment so then we go down to link midi so i've got a complete control plugged into my computer here via usb so i've just selected that for pretty much everything because i've had my most of my midi coming out of that as well and then you just need to click track on and remote on so that that basically enables you to select everything within the parameters on your midi keyboard that you can then go and use with inside your daw then i put five File and folder, save current set as default. So that's basically saving your preferences as that, which is fine. Sample editor, and then you can just sort of leave these as they are. Temporary folder, so that's just basically saving any takes that you've done from recordings and stuff like that. So you can kind of gauge that when it says live recordings from there. Max application, we won't be talking about that because that's kind of like a whole different version, different world into Ableton. Then decoding cache. So basically this is just your memory cache that the computer's allocated to use with this program. So you can increase that if you like. This is basically saving any preferences and stuff like that or any minor of changes that you've had in Ableton and then it will save it into there but you shouldn't need more than 500 megabytes because they're only preference files that are probably about a kilobyte each anyway so you won't need to up that really now plugin sources this is probably something that you're going to have to take note of so rescan rescan plugins if you're not seeing any down the side here just simply click rescan and you should be able to find them if you've got third party plugins then you need to go and use audio units so click on so that's just for Mac so you probably want to use VST plugin system folders if you're on a PC because PC typically only uses VST or VST3. And then if you've got like a plugin folder or VST plugin folder, then click browse and then select where your plugins are based. So they typically on a Mac going to be on Mac HD library audio and then over to plugins and then down to VST and that's where they're all going to be but typically if you're on a Mac you're not going to need VST necessarily you're just going to need audio units then down to library you can kind of leave all these as they are so it's basically just the installation for your packs so these are additional add-on packs that Ableton do and many other companies as well that you can then add on there as well but Ableton thinking ahead of time you can simply just drag and drop them into the browser window to the left here and they will automatically add to that folder anyway so that's super super easy easy and the rest of them keep the same it's all going to be saving in the same directory if you've got sessions from live 8 so this is the version before here then you obviously want it to browse and point towards that window as well record warp and launch so file type AIF or you can keep it to WAV I normally keep it onto WAV because export and import in audio just kind of keeps everything in uniform bit depth at 24 that's more than enough if your computer is starting to lag a little bit then drop it down to 16 but typically 24 you should be able to handle counting so when we're recording you can sort of just have a one bar counting exclusive arm or solo now this is quite interesting because when you click solo on something and then you went to go, go and click solo on another thing it will then mute that track that you've clicked before so click solo and then take arm off and then you, if you click solo on multiple tracks it will then add them up together rather than switching the other one off so that's very similar behavior to what logic does as well click update rate so that's basically just the clip so in terms of it will update every 16 of a bar record session automation in arm track so you can only record all automation when you've hit record basically start playback with record yep so when you're basically recording you want it to be in time with the track so obviously we want that on as well warp phase loop ward short samples and warp one shots yep so basically you don't want it to warp like a one shot you typically just want to leave that as it is so you can drag and drop that in so it's not going to warp it for you auto warp long samples want that off because it's not always going to be perfect
perfect. So every time we probably want to do that manually. Default warp mode on beats. Yep. So we want it to basically lock to the grid if we're going to be doing beats, that is. But as I say, we don't want it to auto warp long samples. We want to do it manually. So if you've got anything longer, like a synth line or something like that, we can do that manually. So if you've got beats on there, it's basically just saying if the one above it was on, we'd want it to snap to beats. But if we're doing it manually, we still want it to snap to the beats to be in time with our track. Create fades on clip edges. I've got that off because when you've got one shots like a kick drum and you import that in, it's going to basically put an auto fade at the beginning and you're going to lose that initial transience to that hit. So launch, default launch mode is a trigger. Yep, that's what we want because we'll, when we basically play, press play, we want it to play through pretty much. Default launch quantization, global. So what that means by global is the quantizing that's going to be at the top. So we want it to snap to whatever the BPM of the grid is and then that's going to basically lock to that. Then the next of them, you can just sort of leave as they are, start recording on scene launch. So basically when you click record, it's going to then record when you basically click it, which is great. Then tap tempo, you can just basically tap where it says tap at the top left here. And then basically if you want like a custom tempo of whatever you feel, you can just sort of tap that and then it will register the BPM of what you're tapping. CPU. Now this is kind of like a very in-depth conversation as well, but I'll keep it simple. If you've got multiple cores on your computer, which you typically would have, you'll have at least two, so a dual core, or you might have four. In our machine, we've got 24 cores, so we want that on. This is what the multiprocessor support is, so we want that on because we want it to be using and running as quick as it can. Multiprocessor rewire, so that's basically if we're using Ableton with another DAW. So we could have this and Logic opened up at the same time and they're going to work together, but we might not necessarily want Logic using all the multi-core multiprocessing power through Ableton because then Ableton will be absorbing a little bit too much, so then they can run side by side. And then licenses and whatever we have there as well, so that's just going to tell you everything that we've got going on there in terms of licenses and what add-ons we have. Okay, so now we've gone through all that, so typically you can more or less, apart from finding the plugins folders, you can kind of just leave everything as it is. It's normally set up to be used on most machines anyway, so that's great. So then at the top left here, we have Link. So this is new to Ableton. This is Ableton Link. So this is basically linking up some instruments and Max for Live stuff as well, but you don't necessarily have to get into that when you get started. So we will be talking about that later, but don't worry about that for now. Tap, we've just been over. BPM, just click on that, drag up and down, and that changes the BPM. Now this is basically a notch forward and a notch backwards. So if you've got something that might be have a little bit of latency on it when you're recording or, and you just want to bump it through a little bit, or maybe you've got a snare drum that might sound better a little bit off the beat, then simply click that and it will just knock it slightly off forward, or obviously the left one going backwards. Then the next to it is time signature, so you can change that. This is your metronome, and then also you can click your counting. So like we mentioned earlier, in the preferences folder, you can select that as one bar, and that's why we've got one bar selected there, two bar or four bar. And then this bar is basically the quantizing bar. So you can have it locking to every two bars, or you can have it locked to every half or a triplet or something like that. So when you're recording MIDI, you can then lock it in to the grid under whatever rhythmic quantization that you wish. Then we have all our transport mode up here, so play button, audio players, and things like that. So basically telling you where, where you are in the track and obviously all your play record and things like that. Then what we have here is our automation arm. So basically when we've got that clicked, we can then start recording some automation, so filters and delays and things like that. So we click that off for now. Then we have a session record button. So basically just recording like a live set or something like that. It's gonna enable everything that you've got going on there. Then here's our loop function, and we can like get it to basically punch out switch. So you you can sort of activate this to prevent arrangement recording. You can kind of adjust where the punch in point is, so where you're going to be recording from, so whether you want it a little bit later or a little bit before. Then we have our draw mode switch, which is basically just drawing in any automation that we want. And then what this is, computer MIDI keyboard, so we can either select that or to use keyboard of our computer, so the QWERTY keyboard, or you can just use our MIDI keyboard, so it basically just switches between the two. And then we've got MIDI. So what MIDI is, when you click that, when you click on a certain thing in purple and then touch a knob on your MIDI controller, it will then start editing that certain switch. So say if I touch this one here, A, and then I start turning a knob on my MIDI keyboard, you'll see like a little button come up. And then when I click MIDI off, so then it stops learning it. When I then start moving that knob, you see how now it's moving. So that's how you MIDI map within Ableton. Then we've got our CPU processing power here. So this is basically just telling us how much memory and how much sort of processing power we're overall using. So if that's a little bit high, you might want to start looking at how to dial some stuff back and how to fix some stuff and where to move certain bits. Then up here, we have basically a MIDI trigger, if you like. So when I press a key, that's then going to start flashing yellow to indicate that we are actually pressing a key. 
Okay, so we've been over the top bar. So to the left here is basically our browser window. So you can go in there, start searching for any little bits that you want to search for. So then we can go on drums or anything like that and then start typing in. But I haven't got a vast amount installed on this machine. So, okay, there you go. So drums is on there and there's sounds and whatever. So if we go on samples and type in drum like that, it's going to then filter down really quickly all our search there. So that's great. And if you want to hide that, you simply just click this little triangle up here and that will open and close like that. And obviously you can drag the windows there as well so we're also going to have places as well so this is basically like if you're saving any presets or saving any sessions then you can always just save them there and you've got quick access to your main computer from your daw so essentially you won't ever have to leave you can access everything through the software to then bring it in and then this is our main live clip view so there's two views to ableton so you have your basically live clip view so your grid view and then you have your arrangement window which you'll probably be familiar with coming from other daws because this is quite a traditional way to do it so then you record everything in a big line going from left to right just like reading a book and then you record everything in like that and if you notice if you haven't noticed already the Ableton logo is what that is so clip view going down arrangement view going from left to right so it took me a little while to work that out but uh, yeah pretty cool and then all our channels have got basically the, the standard inputs and outputs. So on a MIDI channel, you want to pick your MIDI in. So you can normally just pick all ins if you've got one MIDI controller. So yeah, that's more than fine. And then you just click on all in. Or if you want to just use your one MIDI controller or you want to control another MIDI channel from a different MIDI controller. So say, let's do the USB MIDI interface from there. And then you can obviously select what MIDI channels you've got going in. So from a live point of view, this is really handy because you're not going to want one sound or multiple sounds coming from one MIDI keyboard. You're probably going to have a, a few controlling different sounds so that's what that's good for then monitor audio just leave that on auto because if you have it on in it's going to be coming out the main speakers as well so just leave that on auto and it will automatically route it so that it's only being outputted through itself basically then midi 2 output so you can either send that to a rewire so you can send that to another daw if you've got one linked up but typically you won't need the midi to go anywhere you'll just need it to output a sound on the same channel then on audio we have our audio from in so we're probably going to want that basically just external in so if you're recording anything from your audio interface just leave it as external in and then you're obviously going to select what channel you want so you can hear my mic there going up like that so i've got my mic plugged in channel five so that's why it's showing up at five or six but then just on the left hand side and then the individual channel five is showing up there. So that's my voice that you can hear me talking now. If you want to add MIDI or audio channels, you simply go on to create and then insert audio track or insert MIDI track. Obviously the shortcuts are command T for audio and then command uh, shift command T for a MIDI track. And when you start getting familiar with DAWs, shortcuts will make your life so much easier. I never used to really study shortcuts that much because I just wanted to dive in and do it. But since properly learning shortcuts, not just on this program, any bit, software really it definitely makes your life a lot easier and your workflow a lot quicker then we've got reverb and delay to the right here so this is basically it's auto assigned two effects channels so one being a reverb one being a delay and the way you send them to them is on our audio bearing in mind they only work on audio because you can only send audio somewhere there's no point sending a midi channel to a reverb effects unit because this is nothing to reverb if you know what i mean because a midi is just a trigger to trigger something else which creates the sound okay so then audio has to come from there to go into to a basically an effects chain okay so then you simply just turn that up or down and that will determine how much of that signal in this channel you want going to that reverb so on a and then on b now at the moment with ableton you can only do two sends all right there is other ways you can go around that to send it to more effects and things like that but we'll talk about that in another video so this is essentially just you getting started then we've got a master view down here or master channel and this basically just is your general output so you can turn down the headphone volume from there so that's basically like your cues and things like that so if you see down here when you're sampling or when you're trying to look at and listen to different, various different sounds. So if we go and sample there, so you'll see like a little blue headphone down here. This headphone bit is basically relating to that sound. So if we turn that down, you're not going to hear that now. But if we turn that up, you can now hear it. So we can control how loud we want the audition feature within the browser window to be. And then at the bottom here, this is where all your audio effects are going to be. So in audio, it's obviously going to be effects. But then if you go on MIDI, it's going to be an instrument or a sample there, depending what you're dropping in. OK, so then if we just go up to Korg and then just click and drag down to the bottom there, it's then going to automatically open up and then we can simply just press our keys. 
and then it'll automatically route the audio coming out of the keys onto its own channel so you don't have to worry about then routing the MIDI elsewhere to get the audio or anything. You can simply just drag the instrument on onto that MIDI channel and you will hear it. You can then record in MIDI and then play it dead easy. So then we can just go through various different bits. Okay, and it's easy as that. And then if you want to add in any effects, you simply just drag them into the chain. So then if we don't want an instrument, but we might want perhaps, say, like a little compressor. So let's go to the Fab Filter Pro C2, and then that'll open up on that channel, and then we can start selecting what we want to use on this channel as well. Okay, and then it's going to be coming through like that. So it's as easy as that. Then if you want to do it in the main arrangement view, it's basically going to be the same. They're not the, the settings don't change between the two windows. It all works together. So you can see I've got M1 there, and then that's going to be there. But then if we click on MIDI 2, that all the channels are going to disappear because we haven't applied anything to that channel. So back up to the M1, got our Korg M1 and our compressor there. And then we simply just press record, and then we can record through there. Then again, at the bottom, we've got A and B. So we've got a reverb and delay. So like I mentioned earlier, you just simply put the sends to them so if you go back onto this window and then you simply just up how much of it you want to go to that channel so then if I press the key now Okay, and then when we click on that channel, you can see the reverb unit there and the delay on the other one, absolutely named reverb and delay. Cool. And then we've got a really cool, handy little information view down here. So if there's anything that you're not sure of, you simply just drag your mouse over and then it will simply tell you at the bottom there as well. So that is a really handy feature. Logic also has that as well and some other DAWs as well. So normally you have to enable that function, but with Ableton, it's going to be running all the time. Now, if you want to hide this whole bit at the bottom here, you simply click click this triangle here and then it will hide that as well. For all the plugins, you simply just click that. Also, just a quick one worth noting that if you want to zoom in the projects as well, you can either just click this on here just above it and then if you click and hold and drag down, it will then zoom. And then if you want to come out of that, you click and then you drag up. So up and down. Or you can simply just press shift and then press plus and then that will zoom from there. And then you don't have to press shift. You can just press minus and then it will shrink it like that. So that about wraps it up for this video. So by now you should be quite familiar with the application as a whole and basically what sort of settings that you need to be sort of correcting and optimizing for your system setup. If you've got any questions about this video, then please pop them in the comment section below. Please don't forget to give this video a big old thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. So I've been Rory from Hard Production. Thank you for watching. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you want to watch more, then click on the links next to me and don't forget to subscribe. If you want to find out more information about us, then head over to www.hyperproduction.com and join our mailing list to get all the latest. So I'll see you on another video.